Okay, so we're continuing with differential equations, and we are now looking at linear, di linear differential equations. Okay. This is when things start to get interesting, and we can actually apply linear algebra instead of just solving these random linear random differential equations. Okay, so a linear differential equation of order n has the form, okay, there's this huge mess, which is intimidating to look at. But what does it say? What does it have? All right, let's start from this side. Okay, on the right-hand side, you have a function of x. Okay, so not a function of y, not necessarily a constant, a function of x. This whole thing has got two things in it. It's got a, it's got a y and an x. And in general, we're going to think of the y as a function of x. And this, we're going to want to try and find this function of x called y. Okay. At any rate, on the right, we have a function of x. Then here, reading from, we have this term, something times by y. Okay. And we call this, this something is, a, is also a function of x. So we have here, instead of a constant, we have a function of x. Here, we also have a function of x. Okay. Then we have the first derivative of y, dy dx, multiplied by another function of x called a1. And we carry on like this, right? So the next term would be a2 of x times the second derivative of y. Of course, there's nothing here telling us how many derivatives we have. We have n derivatives. Nothing telling us what n is. So a linear differential equation of order n could be, an, could be of order 1, in which case you just have these two terms. It could be of order... Zero, in which case you'd have just that term, and then it would be trivial. It wouldn't really be a differential equation because it wouldn't have a derivative in it. It would only have the zeroth derivative, which is the function itself. Um, you have, if you have an equation of order order two, then you'd have this you have this term, this term, and then you'd have like a two of x dy dx. But of course, you know, if you have something of order two. It has the a2 of x, right? And that's not going to be 0, so that we, so we, really, really, so that we really do have a, a second derivative there. But this one could be 0, you know, so that you don't actually have a first derivative. This thing could be 0, so you don't actually have the function. You know, it would still be in order 2. Nothing saying that these functions can't be constantly 0. Indeed, this function could also be constantly 0. But in general, these are functions of x. Functions of x, not functions of y. So you can think of it actually a little bit like these things, these functions of x, f of x on the right-hand side, and then the a0, a1. They're kind of like constants, so far as y is concerned, right? They don't depend on y. They just depend on x. Okay. Now there's this thing saying that this whole thing can be thought of as t of y. Okay. Now remember that t, in previous chapters, t has been used to mean a transformation. Actually, it's been used to mean a linear transformation. Okay. So somehow this whole thing, this whole thing can be thought of as a linear transformation of y. Right? That there's some there's some transformation that when you put in y, you get out this whole left hand side mess. Okay? So that the equation can be just be written as t of y equals fx. Okay? So this this whole thing really defines the transformation. It says that there's this transformation that when you put in y, what you get out is all this whole function times the nth derivative, function times the n minus one derivative, and so on. Okay? Furthermore, the fact that we've used t here, which we previously reversed for, reserved for linear transformations, suggest, suggests to us that this transformation, which has a result this, may well be a linear transformation. Okay, so let's just, they haven't said anything about that yet, but let's say, is this a linear transformation? I mean, maybe that's really why this chapter is called, why, this, why these things are called linear differential equations. Okay. For now, we can say that maybe the reason it's called linear is because the y's are never, the y's and the derivatives of y, they just appear on their own, right? They're never squared. I mean, you, have, you might have d squared y dx squared, but that's a second derivative. That's not a square. So the y's are never squared. The y's are never, you never take a function of the y. You know, you only take functions of the x. There's never functions of y, only derivatives of y. Okay, that's maybe one reason why it's called linear, but we're going to see, I think, hopefully, that the, another sort of better reason to call it linear is that this t is a linear transformation. Okay, anyway. And then notice that a n of x is not equal to zero. Okay, so it's just saying that if it's going to be order n, you want this leading term to not be zero, because otherwise then you'd have a, this, this term would go away, and really you'd say it was actually of order n minus one. Okay. 
Now, if f of x equals 0, we call this a homogeneous differential equation. Well, that's just like the case where we had ax equals 0 is a homogeneous um, matrix equation or homogeneous system of equations, whatever. Whereas ax equals b, where b is not equal to 0, is non-homogeneous. So we have a similar thing here now. Homogeneous, homogeneous if that's 0, otherwise non-homogeneous. We will see that many of the results we have shown for systems of linear equations hold true for linear differential equations. Okay, so we're going to be able to apply the stuff we learned about systems of linear equations, i.e. systems of linear equations are things like this, okay? We don't now, we no, we no longer think of them since this, we started this course as systems of linear equations. We think of them as just a matrix equation, right? We think of them as a, as a linear transformation of a vector equals something, okay? okay. So we're going to see that stuff about linear algebra is going to be applicable to linear differential equations. Okay. We have a... Now we have a factor theorem. Okay. The set of all solutions to a linear homogeneous differential equation forms a subspace of a vector space of all functions from R to R. Okay. This is an analogy to a theorem we had for... For, for something like x equals zero, right? We know that the solutions to a homogeneous matrix equation like this, they also, they form, so the null space, the null space is a subspace of the vector space that x is in, right? The null space is a vector space. We have a similar thing, so we're having a similar thing here now, except now the vector space is not r to the n, it's the space of all functions from r to the r, right? Okay. We have, now we're gonna prove this, okay. A linear homogeneous differential equation can be written as t of y equals zero, right? This is the, this is the t. So the t of y is t is t of y gives you this whole thing, okay? You put it in y, you get out this. So that's the t of y. Given that y1 and y2 satisfy this differential equation and a constant alpha, we want to show that alpha y1 is a solution, i.e. that t of alpha y1 equals zero, right? Because we're showing basically that the solutions are, the set of solutions is closed under scalar multiplication. That's this one. Then we want to show that the set of solutions is closed under vector addition. That's this one, okay? And to show that, you show that t of y1 plus y2. y1 plus y2 is also a solution, so it also satisfies t of y equals 0. So you can sub it into and for y, and you still satisfy the equation. You still get 0. Okay, but the fact that the derivative is linear will allow us to show this. So first, let's do t alpha y1, okay? So we have t of alpha y1. Now, t is this thing... T of a function gives you this whole thing. You go a n times the nth derivative of the function, a n minus one times the n minus one derivative of the function, and so on until you're going a one times the first derivative of the function, and then a naught times the function. So let's do that. A n, and we don't know what a n is. A n, what a n is, depends on what the transformation was, but it's just some function of x. So we do a n times the nth derivative of the function. Now the function is now not y, is not y, the function is alpha y1, right? So it's the derivative of this whole function, alpha y1. And a n minus 1 times the n minus 1, n minus 1th derivative of alpha y1. And so on, so we have a1 times the first derivative of alpha y1, and then a0 times the zeroth derivative of alpha y1, which really can be thought of as, it missed out a little subscript 1 there, actually. Right, it's not y, it's y1 we're looking at. And of course, the the um, the zeroth derivative is really just the function. So the function is alpha y1, right? That's the function we're talking about. Okay, but the derivative is linear. When you take, that means that the derivative respects scalar multiplication and it respects addition, right? Uh, Reflects scalar multiplication of functions and vector addition. And vector addition, what is the vector space? The vector space is the space of functions. I'm saying the derivative respects adding functions to each other. Okay. In this case, what's important is that it respects multiplying a function by a scalar. It preserves that. So this alpha here can come out the front, right? I mean, first of all, it comes out in front of the derivative, and then you remember that you, here you just have a function times by a scalar, and that, and that can come in any order, right? because multiplication of real numbers is commutative. Uh, in fact, a n of x is not, should not be thought of as a function, actually. It's actually a number, right? It's the va a n is the function. a n of x is the, num is the value the function takes at x, and so you can, of course, swap the order. 
So the alpha comes out there. The alpha comes out here. The alpha comes out of all the terms. Then you factorize out the alpha from all of these things and group everything together. Okay? And now this whole thing is just exactly, again, there's this uh, one missing from there. Um, this whole thing now is exactly t of y1, right? t of y1. So we have alpha times t of y1. Okay. So the t, this, so this t then, look, this is saying the t preserves or respects scalar multiplication, right? It's one half of showing that this t is a linear transformation like we suspected earlier. Okay, and at any rate, because we know, because we're assuming that we're assuming that y one is a solution, we're assuming that y one is a solution, and trying to show that alpha y one is a solution. We've now said that t times alpha y one actually, because t is in linear, or so, so far we don't know it's linear. So far we just know t preserves scalar multiplication. We've proved that here. These three lines, we know that t of alpha y one is actually the same as alpha times t of y one. But t of y one is just zero because y one is a solution to the equation t of y equals zero. So we have alpha times zero, which is zero. So this shows that t of alpha y1 is equal to zero, so alpha y1 is a solution. Okay, then it says the proof that t of y1 plus y2 equals zero is left for the reader. Okay, so you should do that. Try and do that. Try and prove that this is the case. Pause the video, try and prove it, and then I'm also going to do it, like, like I would expect anyone reading this book to do it at this point. Okay, so let's... I believe that you've hopefully you've done it. Um, and now we can either skip this part or you can see if you agree with me or if you haven't managed to do it you can get some tips on how to do it here okay so let's we want to check we assume the y1 and y2 are a solution we want to see the y1 plus y1 plus y2 is a solution so we want to check what we want to find we want to get the t of y1 plus y2 equals zero we're trying to get this equal to zero so you have t of y1 plus y2 but that's just by definition and now you know what I'm going to write this actually I don't want to write out the whole sum. I'm going to write out out with sigma notation. So it's the sum from i equals 1. No, that's actually from i equals 0 to n. Okay. And each term has, I don't know what that is, each term has an ai of x, right? And then it has an i derivative. Okay. And it's the ith derivative of y1 plus y2, right? That's all it is. And this includes a case, special case where we have the zeroth derivative, d0 dx0, which really is just the function itself, y1 plus y2. Okay. Now, the derivative is linear. You, you take the derivative of two functions added together, and it's, just the derivative, and it's just the derivative of each function individually, then the result added together. And the same is true for the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on, right? So this whole thing can be written as this sum to all these a these things. And now we have di dxi of y1 plus di dxi of y2, right? Okay. But now we can split up the whole, this, this sum into two different sums. So the first sum, I'm just going to leave out the, um, the limits now. They're the same as before. Is this thing, di, dxi, uh, y1. And then the next sum is, oh, I'm going to put the limits in just to be complete. Okay. The next one is this. Now we have the idxi of y2, right? Okay, but that first one, that's just the definition of t of y1, right? And the second one, that's just the definition of t of y2. So, so far, in this now, we've proved that t respects or preserves um, addition, vector addition. The vectors here are functions, so it, res it preserves a function addition. So together with, the, with what was proved here, that it respects or preserves scalar multiplication of functions, we now know that T is actually a linear transformation. It's a linear transformation that transforms, a linear transformation that takes a function, gives you another function, takes, takes one function and gives you another function, right? Because, of course, this whole left-hand side, right? This whole left-hand side is actually a function of X, right? You stick X in, 
and you get a value out on the left-hand side. The whole left-hand side is a function of x. It's this function of x. Okay. So t is linear transformation. Um, um, but now here, importantly, we have, been, we have been assuming that y1 and y2 satisfy the differential equation. So we've been assuming that t of y1 equals 0, and that t of y2 equals 0. And so here we have 0 plus 0, which equals 0. OK, so t of y1 plus y2 does equal 0. So y1 plus y2, we've proved this. And so y1 plus y2 does solve the equation. OK, so we've proved then that the set of solutions to the differential equation, to this differential equation, which can be called t of y equals f of x, for short, is a subspace. It's a vector space. It's a subspace of the vector space of all functions from r to r. OK. So now it says more generally, so we've already talked about this. We note that the action of t is linear. It's often called a linear operator rather than a linear transformation since it's, 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 it's inputs of functions. So operator is just often used when you have a function so remember, transformation is really just a function, right? A function from one vector space to another vector space. And for some reason, when you have, when the input to a function is itself a function, or when the input to a transformation is itself a function, then you just call the transformation an operator for some reason. So T is a linear operator, or a linear transformation, or you can call it a linear function as well, or a linear map, okay? And there's one last, so if I write this, this thing down, this function t, this map t, this transformation t, this operator t, it takes things in here, functions from the reals to the reals, and it gives you things in here, functions from the reals to the reals, right? So it's a linear operator, linear transformation from this vector space to this vector space. OK, one last note. The subspace of solutions associated with a linear homogeneous differential equation will have a dimension equal to the order of the differential equation. That's very interesting, because what's the dimension of this thing? It's infinite, right? There's no, you can never, you can't find a basis for this. I mean, we haven't shown that in this course, but it's reasonable to think, if you think about it, how are we gonna find a finite number of functions, a finite set of functions, in terms of which you can express every other function? That doesn't, that seems ridiculous. So this space is certainly infinite dimensional. It's not finite dimensional. But now what we have is that actually the, uh, the range of t, so t, t no, sorry, not the, no, not the range of t. We have that the, the null space of t, the kernel of t, the things, that, the things that t sends to 0, that is a finite dimensional subspace of that space of functions. And it, it's finite dimensional, and its dimension, in fact, is equal to the order of the differential equation. So in this case, n. So the null space of T has dimension n. The set of solutions to the subspace of solutions to the equation T of y equals 0 has dimension n. We'll discuss this in detail later once we have seen the wrong skin. Okay.